Welcome back to the First Gnostic Church of Christ. This is video number 15. We are reading the Gospel of Philip, and I am providing commentary. Let's pick up where we left off. In video 14, we talked about the importance of connecting to Gnosis, God, the Christ, Sophia, in secret. It's a sacred knowledge. It's sacred for many reasons. One being, at the time Philip wrote his gospel, the gospel of Christ, according to Philip, if you were to speak of these truths that Christ shared with the masses at the time he walked earth, it would have upset the authorities, the establishment, the religious establishment in particular, the Sanhedrins, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and they would have sought after you insofar as not only persecuting you, exiling you, excommunicating you, but in many instances, taking your life. Now, in today's world, sharing this knowledge can bring about a similar outcome. If you tell people about Gnosticism, particularly if you tell them you're a Gnostic Christian, they will say you're heretical. They will often excommunicate you, particularly if you are on the end of moving away from regular proto-Orthodox services. The pastor, the preacher, will counsel you, perhaps, and even warn you. The internet is littered with hundreds and hundreds of videos that speak in depth of how Gnosticism is of the devil, of Satan. So though we are but a very small group, they make of us greatly to the point at which we have become their scapegoat. Now this isn't unique. This has been the case throughout history. Whenever truth is brought forth, this realm tends not to favor it so well. And that's why we continue to have bondage, why we continue to have suffering, poverty, wars, death, diseases, plagues, hatred, racism, discrimination, bigotry, so forth and so on. See, the powers that be go about to fashion mechanisms by which people are coerced, and I say coerced and not persuaded, or manipulated because in the world that we live in today you must rely on the system if you are to survive. There is no free land by which you can go and pluck an apple. To do so would be considered a crime. Water is not free. Technically, you're not to collect rainwater in many states. If you were to go to a stream, you can't trust that it's clean, possibly laden with mercury and poison from corporations and industries upstream. So this is the condition of the world we live in. So I say coercion because we live in a world whereby you can no longer survive off the grid. Now, some may say that, well, I can do that. Perhaps you've learned hunting, you live in a cabin, cabin in the woods and you've gotten your hunting license. But keep in mind, you're not to do hunting unless you get a hunting license. And your cabin on the lake, even that, you probably have electricity coming to, afforded to you by taxpayers in the state. And if you were not to do that, and you somehow were able to get off the grid, you're actually going against the law. That's the system we have set up. Now, I'm saying all of this because I'm trying to remind you that this is the scheme that has been ongoing since the beginning of time. And when I talk about the beginning of time, I'm referring to since the beginning of humanity on this planet, when the Demiurge recognized we were at a point in our evolution when we were able to ascertain our own destiny and find gnosis and understand what truth is and thereby ascend at a very rapid pace. Now, you can go about and decide for yourself what that presence is, that force. And Gnostic text, we call them archons, and the Demiurge, demons, angels. In some other groups, they may call them aliens. Others may call them the Illuminati, that just happens to be men in high places with great power in secret, that happens to know some type of esoteric knowledge by which to brainwash the masses. Whatever you want to call it, you cannot deny that 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 force exists. It's alive and well. So this is the reason why even today you must be very mindful about who you are sharing this knowledge with. Furthermore, most people, when you share this type of knowledge, not only will ostracize you, they'll consider you to be a fool, but furthermore, they won't understand what you're sharing. So you're going to be wasting your time. The best you can do is offer it once, maybe twice, as Christ says, and then if they don't receive your message, as Christ says, shake your sandals and move on. Now, the other reason that we don't share 
our own personal walk with God is because of an alchemical truth, and it's evident within existence. Take, for example, as I always utilize this example, the seed. The seed must be in the ground, in the darkness, before it can ferment. It doesn't actually ferment in the sun. It doesn't ferment in the day. It ferments at night. It requires a certain type of or level of light, what we call darkness, before it will actually begin to ferment and begin to crack open, germinate, and start to take root. This is an alchemical truth. The universe that we live in is governed by what we call the Logos. And I encourage you to listen to the series Gospel of Truth if you want to have a fuller understanding of what that Logos is. But is essentially the logic of God. And there are many types of Logos. There's the Logos of the Demiurge and the way he governs, which he governs by good and evil, a dualistic world. And then you have the governance of, or Logos, of the true Mother Father in the Pleroma, which governs through emanation, or the law of love. But in the universe, there is the truth that sustains and governs. Some like to call it intelligent design. Others like to call it collective unconscious or conscience. But essentially what Christ calls it, and Gnostics call it, we call it what Christ aptly calls it truth, and sometimes he calls it knowledge, which translates to mean gnosis. And so when you're going about to fashion whatever your particular path is in life, to find your plumage or your fullness, you must understand this basic spiritual principle. Notice a flower. It does so silently. It doesn't make a show and say, well, look at me, here I am, and I'm going to announce, announce that I'm going to blossom. In fact, it typically is that we go to sleep, we wake up the next morning, and where once was but a bud, now is a fully bloomed rose. This is the very nature of the emanation. This is the way it emanates. It emanates in silence. So this is what Philip is trying to share with us. He's giving us an alchemical secret, but he's doing it again through parables, through allegory, through symbolism, to be wise. Because again, at the time, if he was to share these type of truths, then he would have been prematurely putting himself in harm's way of his own life. Now, we currently live in a, a time whereby we're not enough a threat to the powers that be. But as Gnosticism grows, and it will grow as it is, you can be assured that the powers that be will find ways to shut it down. And this has been the case throughout history. So whatever you have now, cherish it in this moment. Take your books, make sure you secure them. If you want to download these videos or whatever Gnostic videos or truths that you find in great teachers through time, for example, Christ, Martin Luther King, Alan Watts is an another good example. You want to keep those truths somewhere so you have access to them. You don't want to take it for granted that they're always going to be there for you. All right, so this is what we want to understand when we talk about the visible versus the hidden. Understand also that the material realm is an inversion of the spiritual realm. What we're talking about is this realm, the flesh realm, is the opposite of everything that was intended for us from the beginning. So this is how we're starting. We're starting at ground zero and we're ascending back to our fullness. So that brings us into this next section called Ignorance is the Mother of Evil. And again, in Gnosticism, when we talk about evil, what we're talking about is that process by which that Logos paradigm set up by the Demiurge that goes about to divide up the fullness into two components, dark and light. But when we're talking about division in this sense, we're not talking about in a spiritual sense. We're talking about in a literal, physical sense, in a way that is about going about to call one literally bad and the other good. Now, as far as the true father, mother, the true God, there is light and dark, but dark is no more good or bad than light. In fact, they are necessary components. One is the feminine and the other is the masculine. The light is the will going out and the feminine is the vessel that shapes the will. And this is just true. If you meditate on what I just said, you'll see that it's true. Darkness is there to define for you your will. Without it, light would just scatter everywhere and there would be no will. Even though there is will, it would be purposeless, essentially, without dark. So this is something that is actually good. But what the Demiurge went about to do is he took darkness and he shrouded us from it. He hid us from it so that we became ignorant of it. And we also became ignorant of our goodness. We came to believe that we were codependent on the Demiurge and his minions for acceptance for everything. 
for sustenance, for our worthiness. It was the Demiurge who designed things in such a way as to convince us to believe that he had the right to determine who we are based upon his dualistic approach and his set of rules that he set forth. And in this, it created ignorance because we went to sleep and we forgot who we were. But this is this section called Ignorance is the Mother of Evil. So in the world that we're living in, Gnostics considered evil to be that paradigm the Demiurge has created to divide light and darkness and pit them against one another so that you may never have the tools, the two necessary tools by which you can find your will fulfilled. So let's pick up here and start our reading commentary. Ignorance is the mother of all evil. Ignorance leads to death because those who come from ignorance neither were nor are nor will be. You see, ignorance is the state of non-existence. When you're doing something out of ignorance, you're doing something that's an illusion because you believe that you're doing something contrary to reality. That's why it's called ignorance. So you're ignoring, there's the word ignore in the very word ignorance, I-G-N-O-R, ignore, ants, a state of ignoring the truth. And why is it that you are ignoring it? Why not you just don't know the truth? Because the truth is, truth is within you. The Christ has always been within you. So truth resides within you. And the only reason you don't have access to it isn't because you don't know the truth already. It's because you ignore it. And by ignoring it, you create a false reality. And this is what Philip means when he says, ignorance leads to death because those who come from ignorance neither were nor are nor will be. In other words, it just doesn't exist. It's not real. It's something you have fabricated. And this is what leads to suffering because truth sustains life. It heals. And when you're doing the opposite to truth, you're going toward the opposite of life and healing, which is death and suffering and injury, you see. But those in truth will be perfect when all truth is revealed. So you're already perfect spiritually because the spiritual truth is within you. The fullness is within you. But you are like that flower or that rose and we're all different types of flowers you see that must find its plumage it must blossom and when it finds its plumage its fullness that's when it has all truth has been revealed and that perfect that perfect spiritual self becomes the perfect person while hidden truth rests in itself so in other words you are truth and that truth rests in you but when revealed and recognized truth is praised in that it is stronger than ignorance and error that's another way of saying sin to err is to sin to miss the mark and when truth comes forth we have that aha moment that aha moment that you have that epiphany moment that that's Gnosis. That's that moment, the Matrix moment, the Neo moment. That's why he's called Neo, the new moment. He's renewed. His mind's renewed. You know, as canonical text says, renewing of the mind. And so ignorance falls away. It gives freedom. And that's when you find liberation. You see, you're in bondage. You're in bondage to a lie, a lie that's been sowed to you since the beginning of time. You were born into it, that lie. It dominates the vast majority of human beings. Of the seven billion people, five billion of them follow after that religion called Judaism, whether it's through Jewish, Christian, or Islam, or Muslim. They're all rooted in the same. You see, Jews or Jewish which we also get Judas, is the betrayer of Christ. These are not accidents. These are self-evident truths. That's why when you find truth, these things called laws, Levitical law, Mosaic law, they no longer matter to you because you release those shackles and you're free. Now, someone might say Paul himself had the same argument. So are you saying, Thomas, I can do whatever I want? I can go and have orgies and I can go and kill people and people take revenge out on people and steal things that I think I deserve, so forth and so on, and get away with it? Are you saying God supports that? I will say yes and I will say no. And here's the reason. God supports it and that you have the right to do that. You don't not have the right to do that. You have absolutely right to do that. In fact, because it's possible to do that, proves it's your right to do that. Now, remember that Paul had said that all things are permissible, but not all things prudent. Earlier when I talk about the logos of the universe, I am talking about truth liberates you. So when we're seeking revenge, we're not truly free. So we're not really finding truth. You see, we may think we found truth because now we feel free to do whatever we want. We think we are able to do whatever we want and get away with it, right? But the truth of the matter is, we are in bondage to our need for revenge, and thereby we're not really free. Therefore, we haven't really found truth. And if we have the need to consume lots of flesh through orgies, then we're also not free, because we haven't come to understand the true meaning of why we're here. It isn't to go out and create more and more attachments, you see? So you're not really free. So that 
is just a play on words. Whoever's saying those kinds of things to you, when you bring forth the Gnostic truth, they're trying to trick you by saying, well, you make it sound like we do whatever we want. Well, this is the same arguments that the Sadducees and Pharisees used against Christ Jesus and Paul struggled with. That's not something that's new. That's old news. So remind them that, again, about attachments to things of this world put you into bias. You are not truly free, therefore you have not found truth. That's all you need to say. Let them figure it out. You don't need to sit down and try to explain everything to them. Don't throw your pearls before swine. Keep it simple. Christ kept it simple. The Word says, if you follow the truth, the truth will make you free. So understand that. When it's not just about being freed from the law, but it's also being freed to the attachments of this world, the things of this world, that are not ultimately going to bring you healing. You can't just take one spiritual law and say, aha, I've got it. You see, there are many spiritual laws in the universe. And you may say, well, Thomas, how many are there? Well, I will say to you, there are an infinite number of them, because the truth is there is an infinite number of them so that you may have infinity to grow into and experience. Otherwise, once we've gained all of the, the laws of the universe, we'll become bored. We have nothing, no purpose to seek. But the more truths we reveal, the more we're able to grow in spirit and be free. You see, that's how it works. Now, within you, you have your own truth in this realm, and it's limited in that you only have so much you need to reveal. But rest assured, when you go to the Holy Realm, or the Holy Souls Realm, or to the Pleroma, there'll be more truths that you'll want to un reveal and unveil. It's like a never-ending process, you see? And so he continues, he says, If we know the truth, we shall find the fruit of truth within us. See, it's within us, right? If we join with it, it will bring us fulfillment. So always understand that. It's the thing that Christ continually said. Seek truth and it shall set you free. So he's essentially telling you, whatever sets you free is truth. That's what he really is saying to you. And he said it in many ways. He said it in the Gospel of Thomas when he said that you have to bring out what's within you, otherwise it will kill you. See, the truth is within you. And it is, in the self-same time, objectively true and subjectively true. It's objectively true in that we all share a part of God and God's purpose, what He set forth from the beginning, that He is love, and He created us to be love and to be love and to love. But also it's subjective in that the way in which that love is expressed is expressed differently through each one of us. So let's pick up on the next section. It says, things visible and hidden. At present, we encounter the visible things of creation, and we say that they are mighty and worthy, and the hidden things are weak and insignificant. You see that? We think that things that are big are more and better and more worthy. Even in this culture that we live in, now I live in the United States and I know I have we have other listeners, but in the United States we always think of bigger is better. When we go through a drive through they're asking, do you want to make that the next size larger? And people praise you if you have a big mansion and many cars and lots of golden rings on your finger and a huge bank account. Well, look, people look to that and praise that and think that you've accomplished something great. Even our president partially became president because he had billions of dollars. This is the way in which people think. But if it's small, people think it's insignificant and it's weak. They think that that weakness needs to be stomped out because they misinform themselves into believing that that type of weakness is what causes humanity to falter and will lead to that humanity's death. When in reality, the things that are weak are unique and different. And they bring about a part of humankind that is adding to, not taking away from. Furthermore, humankind is only as strong as its weakest link. So the more we serve the weak, the more we serve ourselves. It is not so with the visible things of the of truth. They are weak and insignificant, but the hidden things are mighty and worthy. So when you have something being told to you that seems easy, let me show you how to make a million dollars in five minutes. Let me show you how to get to heaven. Just come up here to the altar and feel shameful and accept Christ and give me some money. You see, if you hear those kinds of things, they're simple, right? E they sound easy. They're trying to sell you something, right? That's what he's talking about. They are weak and insignificant, but the hidden things are mighty and worthy. It doesn't require someone trying to sell you something, and it isn't simple in that it requires a commitment, and you have to go on a treasure hunt. It's hidden, you see. You have to meditate on it. You have to consider it. You have to become its disciple. You have to seek out masters, like the one I mentioned earlier. Alan Watts is what I would consider be a master. And Christ, of course, was a master. You have to meditate on the words. They have to become your sustenance. They have to become your food. And you have to not only meditate on those words, but you have to walk forth and practice those words and find your way toward truth in ways in which you can liberate yourself from whatever bondages you may have that is unique and personal to you and that we all share in common. And that brings us to the next section. Temple 
cross arc. The mysteries are truth made known in symbols and images. Remember the temple is the temple we talked about earlier, the temple in Jerusalem. The cross is the cross that Christ died upon, and then the ark is the ark of the covenant. The bedchamber is hidden. It is the holy of the holies. Again, the bedchamber is that place where the male and the female come together in secret. And when I talk about the physical male and female, we're talking about spiritual male and female, the light and the dark that God created from the beginning. And he made a point to have them work together, but yet they are unique. So they are divided, but they're not divided in definition, but they're divided in that they were created different to work in unison as a consort, complementary, not against one another. But the Demiurge would have you believe they're against one another. So this is the secret bedchamber. It's hidden and it's the most holy place and it's within you. At first, the curtain concealed how God manages creation. This is the curtain talked about in the temple. But when the curtain is torn and what is inside appears, this building will be left deserted or rather will be destroyed. So in other words, the old temple that everyone would rush to, believing that God was out there, well, God's down the street on First Street in that building with a steeple. And we almost go there. That's where everybody believed God resided. And so they couldn't believe when Christ talked about, I'm going to tear this temple down and three days I can raise it back up. They couldn't believe it, what they were hearing. They wanted to take him and kill him. And that at that moment, he said that because they didn't understand what he was saying. He wasn't talking about the physical church out there that we believe that represents God. You see the pastors and preachers, that's supposed to be representatives of God. And even the politicians, they reverence them. They say, oh, look, here is a holy man. And then the pastor says, oh, this president was appointed by God. And then all these people flock and vote for that person because they're following after this, this person who's supposed to represent God somewhere out there. So you don't have access to it. It's over there. But Christ was talking about his own self. He explained it when he said the temple of God is you. It's your body. And God is not found in some physical masonry building, but God is found within you. That's when he talked about, I will destroy this body, bring it back up in three days. And that's exactly what happened. He was crucified. And after three days, he rose up again. And the whole Godhead will flee from here, but not into the Holy of Holies. And so all of those people, they scattered in fear when they see those who represent truth and they bring truth. They have to go to the authorities. They have to go to the secular world and say, do something about this. It's getting out of hand. The masses are ri rising up. They're rebelling. Do something. And so the secular government that's not interested, you see, like Pontius Pilate, he says, okay, let me throw you a nugget so I can get some votes. And so this is what he does. So he goes out and he pleases them. He's not really interested in Jesus. He doesn't care. In fact, he even questioned Christ. And for a moment, he saw Christ was a good man. He said, this is silly. This man just happens to believe some silly stuff. And here you want to kill him. And so he said, well, I'll give you a choice. It'll be this person or that, the thief or Christ, which will it be? And of course, the crowds were riled up because they need a scapegoat, because they need sacrifice, because they believe in the God of sacrifice. And so this is what Christ is talking about when he says, and the whole Godhead will flee from here, but not into the Holy of Holies. So they fled. They were afraid. They were afraid of this one man in robes. How could they harm him? They were a whole Sanhedrin, 72 leaders and all kinds of other holy men and thousands of people flocking to follow them. And they had all these dictates on the books and laws to protect them. They didn't have to pay taxes and they had all these rights, but yet they feared this one man walking through a crowd, saying a few words, humbly. They were so afraid, afraid they fled. They fled to the government, the secular world that they always say they denounce. They, they went to rely on them, not on God, you see, but on the government, the secular government. And so they'll never see or understand the holy of the holies. For it cannot mingle with pure light and perfect fullness, meaning that the Godhead, this Godhead that's in this world, they cannot mingle with this light. Instead, it will remain under the wings of the cross and under its arms. And under the wings, meaning, or under the wings of the cross, meaning under the feet of, of Christ. They'll never be able to rise up. They'll never be able to ascend. And under the arms, meaning behind the arms of the military might, always behind supporting war and death and mayhem. But they themselves will never actually be one of the ones putting their life on the line. They'll manipulate everyone else to do that. See, they're weak men. They're scoundrels. They're cowards. And they use everyone else to do their bidding. bidding you see? And they proclaim themselves as holy men. And so this ark will be salvation for people when floodwaters surge over them. So what he's saying is the ark of the covenant that the Israelites made with Jehovah God didn't save them. The ark will be salvation for people when floodwaters surge over them. Whoever belongs to the priestly order can go inside the curtain along with the high priest. For this reason, the curtain was not torn only at the top, for then only the upper realm would have been opened. You see, so 
only a part was torn away, so that only the special people could enter in to the holy temple. It was not torn only at the bottom, for then it would have revealed only the lower realm. No, it was torn from top to bottom, and this is what's saying. Christ came and he tore, literally tore that curtain wide open. It's that moment, the Wizard of Oz moment, you see, when Dorothy and the little Toto, the little insignificant tiny Toto, this is why the Wizard of Oz is like a dream when you watch it. It's like it's actually telling you the truth of everything. It's why it resonates with you. And so the little dog goes over there and he opens up the curtain. He starts barking. It's that the little dog senses it. Even though animals may have less awareness, they have just as much gnosis. But the fact that they have less awareness gives them the capacity to not create illusions as much as humans. So humans are capable of creating all kinds of machinations in their mind about what truth is. But animals, particularly pets, they live among humans. They don't tend to invent things, mainly because they don't have the capacity at the level at which humans do to, to invent mind, mind tricks psychosis. And so they're more able to tune into things, tune into truth, you see? So this dog sensed that. He started barking. And Dorothy was frightened. It's like, no, no, Toto, come here. When he goes toward the curtain, the dog rips up the curtain. And there's the Oz with his trickery. This is the high priest, you see? This is what they've done. They've tricked the whole world. And that's what Philip is referring to here. But Christ came and he ripped it open from top to bottom. He held nothing back. The upper realm is open for us in the lower realm that we might enter the realm, the hidden realm of truth. This is what's, what is truly worthy and mighty. And we shall enter through symbols that are weak and insignificant, meaning that they are quiet and silent and people don't notice them and people don't make much of them. In fact, they typically define them as hocus pocus, fairy dust, new agey, over here, silliness. See, the scientists will say it's silly, and the religious will say it's blasphemy. And you got to wonder why everybody is against this. you got to wonder. Maybe not everybody, but I'd say the vast majority, I should say, is against this. And how is that any different from what Christ had to go through? The vast majority was against him. This is the way it is. People don't want truth, you see. The vast majority of people can't handle it because they have attachments to this realm. They just don't want to let it go. They're not ready. They're not ready to grow, you see. They are weak compared to perfect glory. There is glory that surpasses glory. There is power that surpasses power. Perfect things have opened to us, the hidden things of truth. The holy of holies were revealed, and the bedchamber invited us in. And this bedchamber, again, is when you finally consummate the marriage of the male and the female, a spiritual type of intercourse. And that's when you bring the male and the female together. And we're not talking about transsexuals or transvestites or hermaphrodites or people that have sex changes. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about material things. But here in Gnosticism, here at FGCC, we don't condemn transsexuals or transgendered. We invite them. We embrace them openly. We don't judge people. But understand that when we talk about integrating the male and the female, we're not talking about anything to do with the physical body. We're talking about spiritual things, the light and the dark. This is alchemical. This is hermetical. This is all of the basics here. Now, as we continue in the Gnostic channel, I'll begin to share how to actually utilize these truths more practically. But for now, my focus is to get through these Gnostic texts because they need to be shared. Because without them, you're not going to get the fundamentals. So let's move to the next section. Revelation of the seed. This is how it works. Philip is now going into how to plant the seed. As long as the seed of the Holy Spirit is hidden, wickedness is ineffective. So whatever you're going about doing in your life to find your fulfillment, don't look for popularity. Don't look for fame, prestige. Don't get on a stage and pronounce it to everyone. Now I'm going to do this, everybody. Make a proclamation. Why do you need to do that? Don't become like the high priest, you see. Practice it in silence. Have the faith that you have it within you to bring it forth. Because whatever you're going to bring forth, if it's in truth, it is meant to be, and it will become, as long as you get out of your own way and you nurture it. And so, as long as the seed of the Holy Spirit is hidden, wickedness is ineffective. It cannot get to you. Now, I talked about this already. Philip is saying this is why he talks in parables, why Christ spoke in parables. It's a way in which to discourage people that are essentially unable to hear these things from hearing it. Though it is not yet removed from the midst of the seed, and they are still enslaved to evil. In other words, even though it's all around them, truth is everywhere. Even though we, Gnostics, walk among men, walk among dividers, that's what evil means, those that divide, divide and conquer, scapegoat, point fingers, judge people, those are the evil ones, meaning dividers. And because they divide, because that's how they go about to bring about their attachments, manifest their wantings and their, des and their desires, you see. 
but we walk among them and they don't see us. You see, but when the seed is revealed, then perfect light will shine on everyone, meaning when the time is full. Don't force it, be patient, have faith. Then what will be evident is not what you're doing, but the light that you're shining. That's what becomes evident. See, then perfect light will shine on everyone. This is why you're here. You're not here to get an Academy Award or get kudos for doing a soup kitchen or to become the next president. Look at me, I'm in the history books. You're here to shine your light and you have a unique light to shine. And when you shine that light, it heals because it's love and it emanates from God, the God within you and within everyone. And as it does that, it heals all everything. It heals one by one. Everything transforms and little by little we are liberated. And all who are in the light will receive the chrism. And remember, that means the anointing, the holy fluids, the secretion. Now, some people want to say that's the waking of the pineal gland. And here at the First Gnostic Church of Christ, we don't condone nor do we reject people's own personal understandings of how to symbolically find their own truth. I will share with you some ideas about the pineal gland. But quite frankly, those are not the mechanisms. Those are not, those are not the essence of truth. They are merely medians that people utilize to find truth, much like the tarot cards or astrology. These are medians that help us understand ourselves better. You see, they're not required. They can be helpful, certainly. So I will provide you as many tools as I can, and each one of you will find each of these tools unique to you and useful to you, and others will not find it useful, and others will find it silly, and that's fine, because we're all unique and different. And some may want to do the walk without any of those mediums, and only use the scriptures provided, and that's fine too. And so it says, Then slaves will be freed and captives ransomed. Quote, Every plant that my Father in heaven has not planted will be pulled out. What is separated will be united. What is empty will be filled. So every plant that has not been planted, meaning, in other words, anyone that has not had the seed germinated will be plucked from this world. In other words, they will find death and they will have to be recycled. They will have to find reincarnation again and come back again. Essentially what he's saying. So it's the revealing of the seed. Whatever you're doing in this life, that's why I'm saying earlier when people talk about when Gnostics share that we are no longer bondage to law, that gives us a license to do whatever we want. They don't understand Gnosticism. They don't understand that it's not about judgment. It's not about condemnation. Christ says, I didn't come here to condemn you. I came here to free you. It is that everything we're doing is defining the seed that we are. And rather or not that seed has found fulfillment. And if it hasn't found fulfillment, then it gets plucked. It gets pulled away, pulled out of the garden. Meaning it goes back into incarnation, into another life because it has attachments. And then finally, the last section in this incredible book called Eternal Light. Everyone who enters the bedchamber will kindle the light. And again, the bedchamber is the male and the female being integrated, meaning there is no judgment. There is no bad or good. There's only good. As God said, everything he created was good because everything is for edification, understanding, whether it be done through life and healing or death and suffering. So you really have two ways to wisdom, either through beauty or pain. Both are you going to bring you gnosis. You can decide which one you want. But understand attachments bring pain and freedom from attachments brings beauty and liberation and healing. So this is what he's saying. When you enter, it will kindle the light. So use the dark side to define who you are in a wise way and use the light to guide you. It's, it's the will. Listen to that inner voice and it'll let you know because your heart will glow with happiness. But it's not the kind of happiness that's about lust. It feels pl it's not about pleasure, but it's about peace. It's about a state of emanating light and, and being light, lighthearted and spiritually joyous. This is like marriages that occur in secret and take place at night. The light of the fire shines. You see what it's like? It's like that. It's shining on the world in such a big way. It's like you can see a thousand miles away during the night and then goes out. That's how it works. When you find the fullness, you leave this realm. So you go out. The mysteries of that marriage, however, are performed in the day and the light, and neither that day nor its light ever sets. If someone becomes an attendant of the bridal chamber, that person will receive the light. If one does not receive it while here in this place, one cannot receive it in the other place. So there's the marriage to this world, which is like that light of the fire. You see, fire is not the actual light. Fire is the consequence of consuming the flesh, which liberates the light. So when we consume the flesh, we liberate the light. Meaning, in other words, when we do away with the flesh, light gets liberated. This is what fire does. But fire is not light, so do not mistake in fire to be light. It's not the same. Fire is a watered-down version of light. It is the light of the Demiurge. It's the way he works. He works through causing suffering and destruction, and he utilizes it through fire, and he balances it with water, which heals. 
But light is both light is both like fire and water. That's why we call it the light waters in the Pleroma. They work together. That's the bridal chamber with the Christ, with the Pleroma, the Sophia. That person will receive light. If one does not receive it while here in this place, one cannot receive it in the other place. Those who receive the light cannot be seen or grasped. Nothing can trouble such people even while they are living in this world. You see, when you're in that state, the world ignores you because you become insignificant to them. As you go off and you live your life in peace and joyous, joyously, living out your life fully. And you don't strive for the things of this world. You don't need to compete. And so no one's threatened by you. But if you go out and you challenge them, then they'll find you threatening. This is what essentially Philip is sharing with you. But ultimately, the truth is always going to come out. So in time, some people will come back as an actual sacrificial lamb. And they will challenge the authority, not directly, but met in a way in which they reveal truths to the masses. But Philip here is talking to the vast majority of us that will go and become insignificant and we're not graspable. Nothing can trouble such people even while they are living in this world. And when they leave this world, they have already received truth through images. See, everything is symbolic. Truth resides symbolically in the very fabric of existence. Is constantly reminding you. See, the monad, mother, father, has blessed you. Sophia has blessed you. Christ has blessed you with truth that abounds in everything. Is constantly reminding you the way that the Galaxies move around, the planets they move, how seeds sprout. They're all telling you the way things actually are. So that's what he's saying when he says, and when they leave the world, they already received truth through images. And the world has become the eternal realm. Meaning, in other words, that they got everything they needed from this corrupt realm, like squeezing lemon out of a, a lemon to make lemon juice, right? To these people, the eternal realm is fullness. And then Philip closes and says, this is the way it is. It is revealed to such a person alone, hidden, not in darkness and night, but hidden in perfect day and holy light. So this is important admonishment because when we talk about Gnostic truth and we're talking about becoming insignificant and not being attached to things of the world, we're not talking about going off in some cloister or some monastery. See, the purpose of finding that fullness isn't so you hoard it to yourself, but so that you shine it to the world so that it does essentially two things. It first reveals darkness for what it is. See, light does that, right? When you turn on the light, like the roaches scattering everywhere. And secondly, it heals. So when you have your fulfillment or you are growing in your fulfillment, you must balance between finding your sacred space, the silence, and finding your will in the world and sharing that will and shining it forth. So Philip, that's why he closes it with this. When he says, this is the way it is, it is revealed to such a person alone, but not in darkness and night, not hidden, but in perfect day and holy light. You make it known to the world, not through forcing yourself on people or coercing them, but simply just being who you are and sharing your walk. And if you're called to share of the Gnostic texts, you share of them in whatever form that is true to you. But you do it through peace, having faith that you don't need to convince anyone. Just speak the truth. The reason you don't need to be afraid or try to convince anyone is because you are practicing faith that the mother father from the beginning has taken care of it all. You have faith. Do you believe that this universe would exist in its complexity thus far if the mother father from the beginning didn't already bring it to be so? So have confidence. It is unfolding just as was intended from the beginning. All right, with that, I'm going to close with the gospel according to Philip. Feel free to leave commentary or if you have any questions, I'll be happy to attempt uh, answering them in the best way I can. But we're going to pick up with a new book in the next video. It's called The Hypostasis of the Archons. So thank you for continuing me on this incredible journey, and we'll pick up again soon. All right, thanks for listening. Bye-bye.